Hi everybody, Pastor Joe here. Thanks again for joining us at our study this week. We're going to be looking at 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. We're only going to look at two verses, but, but these are some of the most challenging words that have ever been written in the New Testament. In fact, they've been debate, debated for thousands of years. So we're going to give it a go tonight. But before we do that, why don't, what do you say we pray and then we'll jump right into it. So let's pray. Father, thank you for Peter's words. Uh, tonight, they're, they're challenging words. They're, they're words that make us think. They're words that make us challenge. But you tell us that our faith is to be a faith of knowledge. And, and so tonight, we ask for your wisdom in the midst of this. We ask for you to guide us and instruct us that, that we might bring glory to your name. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know... Um, Tonight, as I said, we're going to start a very, very challenging study. This probably is, is going to be one of the most challenging studies that, that we've ever t undertaken. In fact, we're going to look at a subject that's been highly controversial for thousands of years. And it starts with three little words in the first few verses of 1 Peter. It says, who are chosen? And it's all this issue of the doctrine of election. Now, before we, you turn me off, l let me, let me encourage you to, to think about this. There are other writers in the New Testament that also talk about this doctrine as well. For example, uh, Paul writes to the Ephesians in chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. Listen to what he says. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as He chose us in Him before the foundations of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before Him. In love He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the kind intention of His will. So there it is. Plain as day. But then he also says to Titus in Titus chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, Paul, a bondservant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the faith of those chosen in God and the knowledge of the truth which according to godliness and the hope of eternal life which God, who cannot lie, promised long ages ago. So, you know, we need to remember that, that Paul wrote, wrote those words. But then he, he wrote again in, in Romans chapter 8, verses 29 and 30, he says this, And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. Now listen to this. For those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to become conformed to the image of His Son, so that He would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom He predestined, He also called. And of those whom He called, He also justified. And those whom He justified, He also glorified. So, so Paul teaches this doctrine throughout his letters. But I, I think we need to remember that Jesus taught this same thing. He also taught the doctrine of election. Listen to John 17, verse 6. I have manifested your name to the men whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Or how about John 6, 44? No one can come to me unless the Father has sent me, has draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. Or John 13, 18. I do not speak of all of you. I know the ones I have chosen. And then Matthew 24, 22. Unless those days have been cut short, no life would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. And you know, you, you read those words in the New Testament and you think, well, this is just a New Testament idea. That's not true. We, we see it also in the Old Testament as well. Just think about the story of Pharaoh, or Abraham, or Moses, or Saul, or David, or Solomon, or even the people of Israel. They were chosen as God's chosen people. So, so this issue of election Underneath it, on the foundation of it, it all deals with God's sovereignty. 
God's sovereignty. I think we need to remember what, what Paul says in Romans 9, that he is the potter, we are the clay. You know, let's, I want to read uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, and, and then what, what I'm going to do is I want to jump into to this few verses, and we're going to look at them in detail, and, and there's some important things to, to take away from this, because the English translation doesn't do us justice in order to understand what Peter is saying. But let me read what he says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. He says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to those who reside as aliens scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father by the sanctifying work of the Spirit that you may obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with His blood. May grace and peace be yours in fullest measure. Man, what, a, what an amazing text. I, I want you to notice that that he gives a, a greeting, and it's a very typical greeting in the New Testament. But Peter calls himself apostle, or literally sent one. And notice that he is not just sent by anybody. He's not sent by the church. He's not sent by other Christians. He is sent by Jesus Christ himself, implying that his words are the words of Jesus himself. He is Jesus' ambassador and representative to these churches. So, you know, that's an important thing to remember as we study these words because Peter is talking on behalf of Jesus. But then he calls us aliens. Aliens in, in the Greek literally means temporary residents or, or those who are foreigners or refugees. And, and we see that throughout the New Testament. In fact, we see it through the Old Testament as well. And for those of you who have, who have the notes, you can see that listed there in all the verses that I've given you. But then he says that, that we, are, we are scattered, that there's a dispersion throughout Asia Minor. And you know, in the New Testament... There, this word is only used two other times in the New Testament. And when it's used in those circumstances, it has a definite article in front of it indicating that the writer was talking about a specific area and in a specific event to a specific place. But here, Peter does not include the definite article. And that means that what he's saying is he's talking in general terms. So he's not only talking about a geographic location, but he's also talking about those who are the recipients of the letter. He's talking about Jews and Gentiles alike. You know, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11, Peter speaks of his readers in spiritual terms, not ethnic, not cultural terms. He says, Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lust, which wage in your soul. So, so the terminology that he's using here is very broad. It, it encompasses a lot of different things. Now, he sends this letter to some churches. And they're specific churches, and they're found in Pontus and Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. And the listing, as I said last week, probably indicates that this letter was a circular letter that was read in one place and then shared around from church to church to church. Now, the area that we're talking about here is modern-day Turkey. Modern-day Turkey. And Pontus was located in the far north region. And we know that Jewish pilgrims from Pontus were in Jerusalem at Pentecost. We see that in Acts chapter 2 verse 9. And this was also the region where that great husband and wife team, Aquila and Priscilla, were, were brought to the Lord. They came to know Jesus and they actually ministered to the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 18 verse 8. But the second place is Galatia. Now that's located in Central Asia, and it contained the terms of Derbe and Lystra and Iconium. 
And Paul ministered here a lot. We, we see that in Acts chapter 14, Acts chapter 16, Acts chapter 18. So this was a common place where Paul would go. And then we have Cappadocia. It was located in the eastern portion of Asia Minor, north of Cilicia. And, and it's mentioned in Acts chapter 2 verse 9 at Pentecost as well. So we know that people from this region were in Jerusalem at Pentecost. And then Asia is mentioned. That's actually in Western Asia Minor. And it and contained the cities of Mysia and Lydia and Korea and Phrygia. And Paul spent a great time here in, in during his third missionary journey in Acts chapter 19 verse 10. And it's mentioned some 12 other times in Acts. So this was a common place for people to go. And then finally Bithynia. It was located in northwestern Asia Minor near the Bosphorus, the strait that separated the, the European and the Asian sections of western Turkey. And it's mentioned only one other time in the New Testament when the, when the Holy Spirit forbid Paul to go to that region to preach. He wanted to go, but the Holy Spirit said, no, you can't go there. Now I want you to notice that this is the region also where John writes about those churches in Revelation chapter 1, verse, uh, chapter 1 through chapter 3, those churches of Ephesus and Smyrna and Pergamum and Thyatira and Sardis and Philadelphia and Laodicea. So this region was a hotbed for Christian activity and Christian growth. Now this region also included Colossae. But you know, it's not mentioned at all in this letter. Nowhere is it mentioned. So the bottom line is that this region was, was a very large area, but it had a huge number of, of believers. And Peter is writing to them about the impending persecution and suffering that he's about, they're about to undertake. And his focus for them is to endure this hardship because, you see, God has selected them to stand firm in their faith. He selected them to stand firm in their faith. It was his intention for them to stand firm in their faith. And you notice, then Peter uses those three words that I've already talked about. He says, who are chosen? You know, those three words, they've been debated, discussed for thousands of years. They will be debated and discussed until Jesus comes again. But the literal word that Peter uses is eklektos. And it's used in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. Then it says this, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who has called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. You know, it's very similar, very, very similar to the terms used in Deuteronomy chapter 7 verse 6, which says, For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people of his own possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. You know, the reality is this, is that God has chosen people out of the world to belong to him. You can see all those verses that we referenced there in, in the notes. So that means that the church, that means you and I, that we are his people. Praise God. Praise God. We should rejoice in that. And you know, throughout the New Testament, uh, this doctrine of election is, re is taught repeatedly. I can't go through all the verses that I've listed there, but you, you can. And I would encourage you, at the end of this, t this study tonight, take those and, and read them. And you know, the Apostle John records... He records that the book of life existed before the foundation of the world. Revelation chapter 13 verses 8 and 17 verse 8. So, so this topic is something that is present in the New Testament. And the reality is, is that God has elected His people to demonstrate His love to the world.
to save them from their sin and to conform them to his image. That's why he has chosen you and I. Praise God for that. But now, notice what Peter says that we have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. I want you to notice in, in verse 2 how Peter talks about the Trinity being involved in our salvation. And first he says, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Now, of all the terms that we have to understand what it means, it's this, this term, foreknowledge. It is critical to understand what it means. And, and we've got to be careful in how do we interpret it. Because if we don't interpret it right, first we, we run the risk of making mankind sovereign for his salvation when, when that is not the message of the Bible. The message of the Bible is that God is sovereign over our salvation. Second, we can't give mankind credit for his salvation when it is all the work of God himself that saves us. You, you know Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9 is, is the paramount verse that points to that. But then third, uh, the scriptures, I hate to say this, but the scriptures are clear that fallen man does not and cannot seek after God. If you want to see that, go to Romans chapter 3 verse 11 or Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1 or 1 John chapter 4 verse 10. So, so we have to understand this phrase foreknowledge because it is God who saves us. It's not us. And so we need to be very, very, very sensitive to that. Now, this term, it does not just mean supernatural knowledge of future events and attitudes. It doesn't mean this advanced notice of our salvation decisions. For example, it's not that God, he, he looked down the quarter of time. And he saw who would believe and then selected them to be saved. That's not what this term means. This term literally means this. God's eternal, predetermined, loving, saving intention. You see, God the Father knew from eternity past that he would send Christ to save sinners for his elect. It was his predetermined plan for mankind. And if we say otherwise, we have to remember that, that God did not look down the corridor of time and, and didn't see that Jesus would choose to die and then select him to be the Savior. No, he chose Jesus to be our Savior before the foundations of the world. Praise God. You know, God the Father didn't just have information about us, but he has this desire to establish an intimate relationship with us before the foundation of the world. So his salvation is not passive, not in any stretch of the imagination. It is very active. It, it is very, very intentional. And it all begins right back in Genesis 3.15 which is called the Proto-Evangelion, the very first time that Moses writes that a Savior would be sent to save us from our sin. Now, according to the foreknowledge of God, we see this played out in the Old Testament. I want you to note Isaiah chapter 49, verses 1 and 2. Listen to what it says. It says, Listen to me, O islands, and pay attention, you peoples from afar. The Lord has called me from the womb. From the body of my mother he named me. He has made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand he has concealed me. And he has, made also, and he has also made me a select arrow. He has hidden me in his quiver. Wow. But then look at Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I have appointed you a prophet to the nations. That's what he told Jeremiah. But then Exodus chapter 33 verse 17. The Lord said to Moses, I will also do this thing of which you have spoken. For you have found favor in my sight and I have known you by name. And then Amos chapter 3 verse 2 when he's talking about the people of Israel. You 
only have I chosen among all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. So you see, God the Father's foreknowledge is the one that selected us in terms of our election for salvation. But then, notice how this, the Holy Spirit is involved. Peter says, by the sanctifying work of the Spirit. You know, this terminology, it encompasses all that the, the Holy Spirit does in our salvation. He produces our faith. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. He, he produces our repentance. Acts chapter 11, verses 15 through 18. He produces our regeneration. Titus 3, 5. And He produces our adoption into God's family. Romans 8, verses 16 and 17. Praise God. But the sanctifying work that he talks about here it is our separation, our consecration, our holiness. You see, he separates us from sin to God. He takes us from darkness to light, from a love of sin to a love of righteousness that makes us more and more holy through a lifelong process called sanctification. That, that's an amazing reality for us as, as believers. And the benefit that he gives is to obey Jesus Christ. You see, there's always this pattern of obedience in our lives as we become servants of righteousness, as we become believers in Jesus Christ. Romans 6, verses 17 and 18, and a whole host of other verses there, they all lay out this reality that once we come to know Jesus as our Savior, obedience to His Word is a character trait of the saint. But then Peter uses this terminology. He says that we are sprinkled with his blood. And what he's talking about here is the security of the saint. And it's a reference that goes all the way back to Exodus chapter 24 verses 3 through 8. You see Moses in this scene that's described in Exodus 24, he sprinkles the people of Israel after giving the law. So it's a, it's a picture, it's a tangible picture of a binding contract. You see, it was a promise that, that, that the people would be obedient to God mediated through that sacrifice. The blood on the altar revealed God's promise to reveal the law and to forgive the people. The blood on the people that was sprinkled on the people revealed their promise to obey. And this same contract, this same kind of idea is inherent in the sacrifice of Christ for us. You see, we have this new covenant of obedience, 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. And, and the Holy Spirit, He continues to cleanse us when we disobey. Praise God that He does that. You know, Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25, or, or chapter 9, verses 11 through 15, chapter 10, 12 through 18, 1 John chapter 1, verses 7 and 9. What a wonderful verse that is. But you see, we not only receive Christ's sacrifice, but we receive the promise to obey as well, and the ability to obey as well. So praise God. And then He gives us the advantage. He says, grace and peace be yours in fullest measure. The, the Greek that Peter uses here literally means the maximum allotment or quantity. In other words, your cup is overflowing. It's more than you can hold. It's the best that can be offered, not only in quantity, but quality. That, that our grace and our peace, as we come to understand that we have been chosen by God, that that, that should make us Go to Him in great grace and great joy and great praise. You know, the whole intent of this doctrine of election is to bring us maximum joy and for us to praise the Lord. No wonder why the Redeemer's Place says that our vision is to joyfully and passionately glorify God by proclaiming the supremacy of Jesus and by edifying His people. It's because God has done that for us first. Amen. You know, 
as we always do, I've got a few questions for you to think about this week. And, and these are going to be good questions because this is a tough subject. But in the midst of this whole discussion of election, what did you notice about our responsibility to share Jesus to our community? I mean, what are the implications? I mean, did you, did you see in here any indication that we are not to share Jesus? Did you see indica any indication that we are not to live for Him? That we are not to reveal uh, Jesus to our community? Uh, notice notice what, what our responsibility still is in the light of this subject. Then here's a se second question. Uh, I want you to think about what are the benefits of election for Christians. Why, why should we rejoice in this subject? Well, why should we praise God for this? Because this is core to understanding this whole subject. And then number three, why do so many people struggle with this doctrine? What do you notice about yourself as you evaluate this teaching? So three great questions, hard subject this week. I, I want to thank you for being with us. I, I want to praise God that you, you made your way through this. If you would like to reach out and, and talk to us about this, just drop us a note at info at theredeemersplace.com. We'd love to hear your thoughts and words. And again, please come and join us this coming Sunday. We're going to have a great time in God's Word as we study what He has to say to us. And I hope to see you then. Thanks and good night.